Hello and welcome to MHQ's Foundation 101 for yet another webcast, this time to talk with Kat Zagati about basic ongoing obligation that a foundation has. Exactly. So appointment of key parties, annual obligations and ongoing ad hoc obligations in a foundation. And these are some of the key questions that people ask, not necessarily at inception, but then once they are convinced about the tool they use, they're like, okay, but how does it really work and what do I need to do? So that's what we are going to tackle today with Kat. So you mentioned uh, the first obligation, the appointment of key parties. So uh, can you elaborate a little bit about this? Of course. So at the time of incorporation of the foundation, the founder must appoint at least two council members. So that's the minimum requirement for the founder to be able to incorporate the foundation. Yep. The beneficiaries or qualified recipients are usually also appointed at the time of incorporation, although there is no legal requirement for such appointment to happen at the onset. A guardian is also not required to be appointed at the time of incorporation of the foundation in case the foundation has a legacy planning object, for instance. However, in case the foundation has a specific chartable or a specific non-chartable object, yep. then in this case, the guardian will have to be appointed since incorporation of the foundation. Okay, clear. So uh, these are the key parties and some of them are mandatory at inception. Now, uh, what interests me is the ongoing obligation to make sure that the uh, foundation is and remains compliant. So uh, what are these typically uh, regular annual obligations? So the foundation's license will have to be renewed on a yearly basis with the register upon the provision of certain documents, for instance, proof of a registered office, data protection statement, and information in case of any change of the key parties of the foundation. Also, the foundation is required to maintain annual accounts, which, which will have to be approved by the council members within, within uh, six months after the end of each financial year. Um, in terms of auditing, however, this requirement is waived in case the foundation's annual turnover is lower than $5 million, which will have to be calculated on a consolidated basis, including all the foundation's subsidiaries, if any, of course. And it's also important to note here, Jan, that although the foundation is required to maintain these annual accounts, as I just said, the registers are currently not conditioning the renewal of the foundation's license to the submission of the accounting report by the foundation. Yeah, but at the same time, we also witness increasingly both uh, the DFC and ADGM uh, supervising authorities checking on foundation and, and asking for, okay, show me uh, your, your, your records, show me uh, your, the status of your financials. These, these are just routine checks, but they are happening increasingly more. So at the very least, these two things should be uh, managed, uh, including the maintenance of the financial position of the foundation and its underlying structures at all times. Uh, there are, of course, other uh, obligations, typically ad hoc, uh, typically if something changes or uh, there's, a, there's a material uh, amendment to the beneficial owners. Can you talk about this as well? Yes. So for the sake of good corporate governance, it's paramount that strategic decisions being made by the foundation is properly recorded by means of a council member's meetings of meeting. For instance, uh, replacement of council members, mm -hmm. appointment of a new guardian, addition or exclusion of a beneficiary, opening of a bank account, and addition of any assets. So another thing that's important that I note here, um, in case of any change in the key parties of the foundation, the council members in this case will have to update and review the bylaws, and the reviewed bylaws will have to be uh, submitted to the register to update their records as well. Yeah. Okay, very clear. Uh, so let's now look at some of the key decisions that uh, a foundation can take and will take during its life and uh, how it really works. Because a lot of people ask, okay, I want to open a bank account. How does it work? I want to buy real estate. So let's look into some of these. So presumably I would like to add assets onto the foundation. So uh, how is this done process-wise and what sort of documents need to be either prepared, executed or updated? Okay, so if the founder wishes to contribute assets to the foundation, a couple of formalities will have to take place in order to properly document this addition. So firstly, a deed of addition will have to be executed between the founder, who is the person contributing the assets, and mm -hmm. the foundation. 
Then secondly, the founder will have to issue a letter of wishes to the council members, uh, proposing and suggesting the council members to accept the assets being donated uh, to the foundation. Thirdly, the council members would then uh, deliberate about the, the founder's proposal and suggestion, and upon acceptance, a minutes of meetings uh, will have to be, uh, then be executed by the council members. Yeah. So once the above steps are completed, then the relevant transfer instruments can be uh, executed to formalize the donation or transfer of the assets to the foundation. And finally, as the last step, the asset register of the foundation will have to be updated so that these new assets can be reflected in the books um, of the foundation. Understood, clear. Now you mentioned what if uh, the founder wants to uh, provide assets onto the foundation. We know that other people called contributors can also uh, uh, transfer assets onto the foundation. What would be the process then? In this case, the, pro the process is very similar, except, except from the fact that uh, the deed of addition in this case and the relevant transfer instruments will have to be executed between the third party contributor and not the founder, of course, and the foundation. Okay, clear. Uh, it is not unusual for one of the assets uh, classes held or controlled by a foundation to be a financial portfolio or, or, or a bank account with cash uh, opened with a tier one uh, custodian around the world. So let's assume I'm the founder. I want the foundation to open a bank account and settle some of my portfolio portfolios onto that account. How does it work? So in this case, the founder should propose via letter of wishes and the council members should deliberate and approve via council member resolutions the opening of this bank account or, or, or uh, addition of this portfolio. So in this case, um, the signatory powers on the account can be delegated to third parties and not necessarily be kept by the council members. Uh -huh. And yeah, and again, the asset register, as I said before, must always be updated so that this new portfolio or bank account can be reflected in the books of the foundation. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, real estate in this country. Uh, most of uh, DIFC's foundations uh, were set up with this in mind because the DIFC uh, is very compatible with uh, the land department. What about uh, real estate? I want to acquire real estate or donate real estate to a foundation. How does that work? It's a very similar process again. For the acquisition of real estate, we will have to put in place a deed of addition, mm -hmm. the founder's letter of wishes, and minutes of meetings of the council members, along with, again, the updated asset register. Yeah. And in case of sale of a property, then only a letter of wishes, a minutes of meetings, and the updated asset register will be required, not counting, of course, the transfer instruments that will have to be submitted to the competent authorities. So what we wanted to illustrate with these couple of examples is that it is not rocket science. Uh, it is very similar to what you would have in a company where it needs to be documented internally and towards the outside, but these steps needs to be taken to facilitate the asset being transferred in the first place uh, and then reflected in the books of account uh, of the foundation. And it's a good habit to have and to do it properly. Of course, that's something we're, uh, a firm like MHQ can assist with, but it's uh, something for every founder and operator of foundation should know. Katzagati, this was eye-opening. Thank you very much Thank and you. have a good day. Bye-bye.